Hello to everyone who's filing in. Um, welcome back. I hope you all had a, um, a lovely time um, having some lunch and, and uh, maybe getting some jobs done or something in our break. Um, we may have less people than I had expected in this session. And so as a result, I would love to encourage everyone, if you wanted to, feel free to turn on your cameras and um, we probably won't all unmute ourselves at once because um, we get a lot of feedback that way. But if you would like to, feel free to turn on your camera um, and we will be able to have a little bit more of a face-to-face -face kind of discussion throughout this session. So um, I'm sure you've all met me before. My name's Katie. Um, I've been the one emailing everyone um, trying to um, get this event together. And I'm coming to you today from Yugam Bear Country um, up on the Gold Coast. And we've had some beautiful rain this morning and um, it's starting to get muggy again. So um, welcome and thank you for joining us. The way this session is going to work today is uh, we are going to, we've got had a few changes in the schedule. Welcome to everyone as you're starting to appear on my screen in front of me. It's lovely to see you. Uh, we are going to have two sessions that uh, were submitted as part of our study slam. So they're slightly shorter. However, we're not sticking to any rules. Um, so they may go over the three minutes. It's no problem. We're going to, I think one of them's a pre-recorded video and then, um, which is show of, and then Yagi is going to share. And then I've got an amazing animated video that Nicola has prepared for the RISE conference, which is next week. And she has kindly shared it with us today. Unfortunately, she can't be here in person, um, but we've been having some workshops over the last few months and, and she came to those and, and she's created this great um, animated little short video. So I'll share that. And then we're going to hear from Megan and Gurmeet sharing um, about their posters in which you can find and look at in detail in their subsection, subsession, which is as you scroll down the agenda, you should be able to find that there. But everyone can stay in this one spot and we'll hear from them and hopefully we'll all have some great questions to share. So for the questions, I'd love them to be done verbally if we can, so that we can get a little bit of a conversation happening. I've got some people um, keeping an eye on the chat and on the Q&A if you do put something in there and then those people who are helping me may shout out your question as well. So uh, that's it from me. I'm going to hand over to Shoab who has a presentation, a study slam on helping Markle sparkle. So I'm interested to find out yep. um, how that is. Uh, so, yeah, I'd like to thank my supervisor, Marv Shifford, uh, for coming up this uh, interesting topic heading. So I recorded it um, because um, I thought it would be much easier to just record. So I'm sharing uh, my presentation now. Yeah. We can't see anything yet. Okay. Yeah. Just give me a sec. No problem. Yep. Can you see me now? Nearly. Yeah. Welcome. I'm Mirza Shoeb. I have started PhD about three months ago. And this is brief introduction of my topic. A particular essential oil is in a must carry list when Meghan Markle travels. Yes, I will be talking about treaty essential oil, which is widely used in cosmetic and therapeutic products. Australia supplies around 80% of the global tree tree oil and Southern Cross University breeding program is working hard to improve its production. Oil yield depends on the leaf biomass and the oil content in the leaf. Therefore, one of the main focus is to improve leaf biomass production. 
Imagine you are a tree breeder and you are in a field of thousands of trees, much taller than you, and you want to find the most productively biomass producing tree. You could cut down each tree, separate leaves and weigh those. That would take you and a team of people a few weeks and is destructive. So you no longer have your trees. And if you need to do it every year, then it wouldn't be fun. Alternatively, you could estimate the leaf amount visually and measure other attributes to predict leaf biomass. But visual assessment is subjective and not very accurate. My job is to make this task e as easy as possible while producing the best predictive leaf biomass data. Goldfish can see infrared light and bee can see ultraviolet light. Human can see red, green and blue light. Now imagine it. if we could view the world in the eyes of a human, goldfish, bee or even more. Yes, we can do this through multi or hyper spectral camera. Red, green, blue, infrared, ultraviolet and many other spectra like a radio wave, microwave, x-ray and gamma ray is a part of electromagnetic spectra. By seeing through this unseen electromagnetic spectra we can measure different aspect of plants and that what remote sensing tools do and I want to use a remote sensing tool for predicting leaf biomass data non-destructively. After my initial three-month literature review at this stage, I'm considering to use multispectral camera to predict tree tree biomass. So why multispectral camera? The multispectral camera covers red, green, blue, near infrared spectra. Red, green, blue spectra will help us to predict volume of the tree and near infrared spectra found to give additional information related to plant density. By combining volumetric data with density related data hopefully will allow us to predict biomass more accurately. However, a massive amount of data will be generated from this camera and we'll get help of machine learning, a process to teach computer to automatically learn and improve from experience, to process those vast amount of data efficiently and accurately to make sense and to predict biomass. And hopefully at the end of the project, we won't need to cut and harvest thousands of trees. Thank you. Sorry, it's just going on. Uh, so. That's wonderful. Yeah. That was really interesting. I loved your um, visuals there. It worked really well. I, well would like to, I would like to open it up to any questions from the audience first. Um, so I'm not sure if there's been any put in the actual feed, but if someone wanted to unmute and jump in. Sorry. It's, um... Sorry, I'm just trying to unshare this thing. Oh, no, you've yeah. unshared. Yeah, you already unshared. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Have you been able to find us again? Are there any questions from the audience? Shay, there's are you? Not, there's none in the, in the Q&A at this point. Give it a few seconds. I have a question, if no one else has a question, to jump in. Is that all right? Um, so was that your idea to come up with the, the Megan Markle to Sparkle? Yeah, no, it's uh, my supervisor. We are talking <laughs> about different things and um, because he's a, she is the icon for promoting uh, TT industry uses this uh, dialogue often. Yeah. So, and also I think the analogy is to, just to make it a bit more... Um, connecting to the topics like B and um, other things. So, because it's a boring topic for who is uh, 
who is not into you know in, into the topics so, of yeah. oh it doesn't yeah. sound boring no, it, doesn't. it sounds amazing to be able to, to see those okay. things without destroying the um the yeah. trees themselves sounds such important work I think it's uh, it's more important uh, because in uh, in the uh, next ten year time, remote sensing will uh, use for uh, measuring everything uh, in the agriculture because it will um, those sensor will measure plants parameter and make a decision whether to fertilize or whether to irrigate. So it's a really expanding area. I know you're very early on in your research. You're only three months in. Do you have any ideas about how you're going to go about conducting your research? Like what exactly you're going to do? So at this moment, we are in the process of, for selecting what equipment will be ideal for our work. And we have a couple of options, but some of the options are very expensive. And the technical side of it is supposed to be supported by Southern Queensland University. I think they have some bureaucracy. So at this moment, uh, we are thinking uh, about the budget as well as what will be the appropriate things to do. So once we select that, then um, there is a paper on uh, how to do uh, biomass. But our main problem is to separating the leaf biomass uh, from the tree. Uh, and I didn't find any good paper to do that, but we have few clues at this stage. Maybe we'll be able to some, use some of it. So basically what happened, any of the tool we use, uh, it is a process with a um, computer to separate particular ray. And once we separate this ray, we can find uh, information. I can share quickly, just if you're interested how it is done uh, in a second. Um, we might need want. to move on, um, but if it's easy for you to share, it'd be great to put it in your chat section. Underneath. Oh, that's fine. Um, so basically they separate different, uh, different wavelength and uh, from this wavelength, they can measure different parameter, even physiochemical parameter of the plants as well. So we'll, we'll look into that to separating uh, parameter as well as then uh, try, to, um, try to make it more efficient through the machine learning. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing today and congratulations for sharing so early on in your journey as well. And we hope to maybe see you next year um, in person, which would be wonderful. Hopefully, so hopefully. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We're going to move on now to Yagia's presentation. Um, he is sharing with us today on an introduction to using yoga with disabled and traumatized people. So I'm going to um, hand on over uh, to Yagia. Hey, <clears throat> can you hear me? Am I am I on? Yes. It's all, it's all happening, is it? It's all happening. Okay, my name's Yagia, and I'm speaking from Nimbin. Um, and I acknowledge the elders, past and present, from Bunjlung country, and also my Guru Swami Satchinanda. Um, so what's, what this talk is about is uh, I was selected uh, as one of about 12 people to, on, this, on a pilot project on a girl who I will call Amanda because I can't say her real name. This client um, has got a history of trauma and autism and um, it results in her attacking people and destroying things. I've been working there for about four years now. And in that time, uh, I've instilled yoga as a daily uh, activity for her. So all the staff, whoever's on shift, and there's two people on shift at any given time because she, she can attack you. Um, all the staff teach yoga to, to Amanda and the classes started from a five minute simple class to now it goes to about uh, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Um, her, her successes are quite incredible. She doesn't uh, 
smear fecal smearing anymore. She doesn't wake up at night screaming as much as she used to. Um, she doesn't attack people nearly as much as she used to. In fact, she hasn't for quite a while now. Um, one of the ex one of these successes, there's there's a bunch of successes that are attributable not only to yoga but to the whole situation because she's now in a safe situation and she has a regular consistent program and yoga is just part of that so we can't attribute all her successes to yoga but uh, there are a few that we can attribute to them and one of them is uh, an example of her focus so this is someone who would normally not be able to focus at all and one of the yoga exercises that we do with her is balancing exercises so um, she has to look at a point on the wall and she's into counting so we get her to count while she's looking and balancing on on one foot now we took her to the dentist and she had to put her face put her head in a, some apparatus and keep perfectly still while the machine took an x-ray of her teeth and she was able to keep perfectly still for about 30 seconds so when she first came this was unheard of that she would be able to do this there's other there's other uh things too uh because she's traumatized she started speaking in a very soft voice no one could hear her you'd have to get her to repeat and sh she'd put her head down and talk very softly um so i introduced singing lessons and as well as singing lessons there's also um a thing in yoga called the lion pose where you stick your tongue out and make a roar which opens up your 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 throat um now she talks normally there's a whole i've got a whole list here of sex i've got a whole list of successes and i'm not going to go through them because it's too it's too much <laughs> um one of the other things that we're doing with her is is breathing so in in yoga there's also um and it is breathing in one nostril and out the other nostril and then back again and uh what this does is balance the balance the energy in the brain so normally you would do it with uh like this but she does it very simply like this another exercise that we do with her is uh what in yoga we call in satsananda yoga we call mindful uh antimon which is generally sort of known now as mindfulness um so in this exercise at the near the end of all her yoga asanas she just stands there and listens to the sounds so this this is a stepped approach where it goes from listening to the sounds and watching the breath and then watching the thoughts so so far it hasn't gone on past the sounds but this is like an idea of of how of how this approach is going um maybe one minute left okay how about we just have some questions now because uh is that okay of course it is sorry i didn't mean to interrupt i just wanted to give you a little warning yeah, sure. um Thank you so much. Um, that was fascinating. I have a question here from the um, Q and A. It's uh, is Amanda an, a child or an adult? She's a twenty-three year old girl. Um, the the whole the whole project costs the government about two and a half million dollars a year, and. Um, she started off in an organization like any disabled people but she ruined the place and she attacked people 
Then she got sent to uh, Lismore Hospital. They didn't know what to do with her. They sent her down to Sydney and she was virtually in a padded cell there for two years while a whole group of psychologists and social workers tried to figure out what to do with her. And then they, uh, they found this organisation that I work, now work for to take it on and we have a specially built house for her. Okay. Fascinating. Um, I've got one more question from the uh, Q&A here and then I'll open it up to everyone else who's here. So if you have a question, hold it ready. Um, the question I've got here is how long has it taken before the carers were able to see a noticeable difference? So how long from the start of the treatment? The changes are very uh, are gradual. It's like if you're in a relationship with someone you know, you, you, it's difficult to see them change, but if you come in, you know, after a period of time, you can see the change. So uh, it's, 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 it's incremental. It's a difficult question to answer because um, some changes were quite early on and like the fecal smearing, she stopped doing that about two years ago and um, sleeping patterns, she's sort of gone into being able to sleep all through the night just in the last few months. And some of those are to do with the medication too. You know, she's on, med she's on diazepam and a few medications and the, the psychiatrist uh, has a look at her medication every few months and tweaks it. Mm -hmm. so there's a whole bunch of factors. It's not, it's not just yoga, but I'm only talking about how the yoga component has affected this situation. I'll just open up to anyone else who'd like, uh, Megan Lee. Hello, um, I'm really interested in this. Um, mental health is, is my forte and I just love the idea of lifestyle factors being used as um, prevention and treatment for um, serious mental illness like what you're talking about. I am really interested in the other factors of the of, of what you are doing with her. So the, the, what the yoga happens every day. Is that right? Uh, every six, six days a week on one of those Perfect. days, um, a, a person comes in and teaches her another exercise. Excellent. That's so good. And, and it's, do you think that the benefits are from the mindfulness component of the yoga, or do you think it, the benefits might be from the physical activity component of the yoga? Uh, I think both and in different ways. So one of them is just having a routine. So this person, if she's not given any other choices, she'll sit on her bed and just sit on her bed all day or watch TV all day and do nothing else. So, um, you know, the, the, there's a whole difference of like um, intricacy in, 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 in answering this question. Mm. that um, it's sort of, it can get a bit complicated, mm. but, but it, it's, it's a lot of different factors. Yeah. I would be really interested to see the other things that you, you were doing. Like um, you did say that she has uh, some form of ASD. Is that right? Is she on the yeah. autism spectrum? Yeah. yeah. So one of the things that I'm really interested in is ASD and nutrition as well. It's kind of nutrition and psychology. It's my thing. Yeah. But, um, is there anything happening with that side of things? With the nutrition side, well, mm. she has she has a dietitian, and generally speaking, uh, she has low carbohydrates, pretty good food, but uh, every night she has one of those frozen meals that you buy from Woolworths, mm. which um, <clears throat> you know they say that the nutritional component is quite good, but I don't know. Yeah, and it can also with people who have who are on the spectrum it is quite difficult to get them to eat certain textures certain certain types yeah of she's okay she she'll eat she'll eat anything oh, and, she, and and once a week she has uh, a choice of something from the shops you know and she might get fish and chips and a coke mm -hmm. from the shops. so apart from that all her food is good that's really good to hear but but one of the other one of the other main parts of it is consistency as you probably know, with autism, consistency is a big factor and predictability. So 
it, she goes out, she, she gets taken out twice a week for about three hours on each, each occasion with three workers in case she you know, attacks people. And when she, before she goes out, she has a visualization read to her. So the visualization is something like, okay, at 12 o'clock, so and so and so and so and so and so are going to come and pick you up and you're going to go in the white car and you're going to go down there and then you're going to get out on that side of the car and you'll see the beach and then you'll walk along the beach and you'll collect shells and etc etc. So a whole sort of vis visualization that she's prepared for and that's made such a difference too. Mm. That, that sounds really good and yeah. it's interesting that you're able to scaffold mindfulness into other parts of her life as well which is great. Yeah yeah it's a really interesting project. Yeah. I can see that Gurmeet has a question. And yeah, I gonna... have just a uh, little question. That is she taking any Ayurvedic medications as well? Not that I'm aware of. No. Oh, she does have uh, rescue remedy. That's home, but that's homeopathic. So I don't think that really fits into Ayurvedic. So um, as far as Ayurvedic medicine, are you thinking of any particular type? No, I'm just because uh, she's doing yoga, and uh, if you're doing yoga and having Ayurvedic medications as well together, then, then it, I, because I'm yeah. from India, so I know that they work really. Oh, no, they work really well together. Yeah, but because the, they are, they are combined with like yoga with Ayurvedic medications. It, it works really well. The, the, the point is that I just happened to be one of the workers there and when oh. she, and, I, and from the start, and when she came in to the service from the start, nobody really knew what to do with her. And mm. because I was there, I was able to, to get the yoga program happening just because it's my passion and mm. I knew that it, would, that it would work for her. All the other um, staff that work there, apart from one, they, they, they're not into yoga. They do it because, uh. they, because they, they come to work, you know, but yeah. it's not their thing. Thank you so much, Yagya. We've got... Um, we have run out of time. We've, we've got a couple of other things that we need to um, get on with. I do have one question in the chat here and I will ask it in just a moment. Um, but there seems to be a lot of interest in this. It's a really fascinating um, discussion. On the agenda, you will find um, Yagi's subsection and you can certainly put more questions on there and he'll be able to answer there later on um, just by typing. Uh, so the question I've got in the chat here is um, just very brief answer. Uh, what is your goal with this young woman and what is your measurement of success? There's a lot of data collection that are collected so there's lots of graphs and scales and things like that. The end result is that hopefully she'll be able to, um, to go back into a, a, a disability group home and just be another ordinary disabled person without special needs, without the, without the intense special needs that she's getting now. Thank you so much. Um, what a wonderful presentation. So I'm sure everyone else is applauding um, behind their muted microphones right now. Um, we Thank will you. I was, I was a bit nervous to start with, I'll tell you now. <laughs> no, you did really well. It was fantastic. Um, and a great discussion, which is what I always like to see, a good discussion. Um, we have Nicola Fraser, unfortunately, is unable to be here today. Um, but she has shared with me her um, animated picture, uh, uh, animated video. So I'm going to share that now. Um, and if you have any questions about that, you'll be able to pop them again in her little section and she'll be able to jump on when she has some time to be able to attend and answer there for you. So I'm just going to take a second to share this um, screen. Just one moment, sorry. Sea anemones are soft-bodied animals related to corals. And they live in a range of habitats from shallow rock pools to the deep ocean. Anemones are important marine animals. 
But unfortunately for them, they happen to be popular in home aquaria, and for this purpose are mostly collected from the wild. This collection is causing damage to coral reefs around the world. Breeding anemones in captivity could help reduce some of the damage, but we know almost nothing about how to do this or which are the most popular species. For my PhD, I first surveyed aquarium hobbyists and businesses in 39 countries. The bubble-tipped anemone was the most popular species worldwide, and a few other species would be desirable if they were easier to obtain. Also, hobbyists and businesses would prefer to buy captive bred anemones rather than wild harvested, and would be prepared to pay more for the captive bred animals. Sea anemones spawn in a similar manner to corals, and fertilised eggs develop into swimming larvae. I worked with these larvae and they showed similar survival rates when kept in four different seawater types. When it came to feeding the juvenile anemones, they grew best when fed live Artemia, a tiny prawn-like creature commonly known as a sea monkey. I then worked with adult anemones because some can make copies of themselves by dividing in half. And I wanted to see if I could capitalise on this process to generate more anemones in captivity by cutting them in half. I cut five different species of anemone and had success with two of those, indicating it is possible to use this method for captive breeding of some anemones. In summary, I learned which were the most popular species and that buyers want captive bred anemones. I learned about looking after very young sea anemones and about cultivating anemones by cutting them in half. This research will contribute to reducing the need for wild harvesting of anemones and help lead to successful sea anemone captive breeding in the future and thence to a more sustainable sea anemone trade. Well, I think that was wonderful. <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure if we should do questions. There's, there's no real point in doing questions. Now, did anyone want to make a comment? Leslie does. You're on mute though, Leslie. No, I just wanted to say, <clears throat> I was in a workshop with, um, with Katie and Nicola when we were putting those um, anime videos together. And I think she's done a wonderful job, don't you think, Katie? Uh, yeah, I was chuffed when I saw it, which is why I begged her if we could show it. Cause I just, um, she was preparing it for the Ra uh, RISE conference that's coming up next week. And um, I think that it just communicates um, so clearly her topic. Yes, and she did a great job. I was actually quite shocked when she said she literally cut the sea anemones in half. <laughs> I thought, like with octopus, I understand that, you know, they can regenerate and, and um, uh, copy themselves, but I, I thought there might have been a bit more of a gentler process, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 thought, I, I wasn't sure I'd heard her right. I, I'd assume she was talking about gene splicing or something. <laughs> It'd be interesting. I might write a comment on there. I was, I was like, does it hurt them? But maybe that's just me um, not understanding how it all works. <laughs> Did anyone yeah. else want to say anything before we move on? I can't see anyone. Yeah, so. we're going to back next year. Definitely. Okay, so um, so that brings, we've got about 15 minutes, well, no, 20 minutes left of this session. So I'm going to just divide that up evenly between Megan and Gurmeet. We've had a little change in our um, schedule. Uh, we did have uh, some 15 minute drop-in sessions uh, for Megan and Gurmeet to be able to go and talk to her about, talk to them about their posters and um, I, I was trying to mimic what it would be like at a um, 
at a conference where you get to walk by the posters and ask questions, but we've decided to do it in this space. Uh, so you'll still be able to go and have a really close look at Megan and Gurmeet's posters and please engage with them about their research. They're so passionate about their topics. Ask questions in the Q&A and they're really good at getting back to you. I'm sure they'll answer the questions in there. But for now, we might move to, um, uh, we'll go to Gurmeet first and then we'll finish up with, is that okay Gurmeet? Yeah, I'm happy to go. And uh, we'll, we'll, if Megan would like to go, it's all right because she has two. I'm let's having do, to go last. It's fine. Let's do go meet now and then we'll um, move on to Megan. And um, I'll hand it over to you. Go meet is studying a, an extended COMB model of consumer behavior leading to increased. Oh. Actually, go meet. I'm so sorry. Can you introduce that? My screen has cut off and I can't yeah, see. Yeah, so it's oh. an extended combi model of consumer behavior leading to increased plant based and reduced meat based diets, an Australian study. So I'm just sharing my screen in Canva where I created my poster so that I can scroll it easily and you can read if you like and ask me if you want to know anything. So it's all about plant-based and reduced meat-based diets. And I'm studying consu Australian consumers' behaviors towards plant-based diets. So what they think about and what factors are there. And so uh, I completed my COC in October, sorry, in September last month. And so I have some recommendations and suggestions from my COC panel members. So everything is all good but i haven't decided yet uh, about my data collection because i proposed them about online survey that only quantitative but they suggested me to do mixed methods so i'm confused uh, so they 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 asked me to do basically three things uh, pilot study of 70 to 80 consumers first and then online survey and then focus groups so yeah, so I know there are lots of PhD students who are in the last stage of their PhD. So I might uh, ask for their suggestions so that I can talk to my supervisors and we can build it up. What a fantastic so, idea, Gurmeet. Yeah, so I'm, I'm totally confused because some people are saying there is no point of doing pilot study with 70, 80 people and then uh, doing focus group as well because they will give the same same results. So, and uh, if you are doing three things, it will be time consuming. Mm. And as an international student, so I need to finish in time because of the visa implications. So, yeah, so I, am, I might propose my supervisors to do two things if they really want to do mixed methods. So I'm happy to do mixed methods, but, but sometimes they say we will go for interviews. So they are confused. <laughs> They're making me confused. So, yeah. Feel free to sure. jump in if you have um, a, something to say in, in response to that. I think that's a, a really productive discussion for Gourmet. Yeah. Has everyone done mixed methods? I'm yeah, doing I know. mixed methods at the moment for my PhD, also in nutrition issue type stuff. So um, from what I have done, I, I've kind of got two arms of my mixed methods research. The first arm is... Uh, focus group studies and usually with the qualitative side of a mixed methods research project you use the experiences of people to inform the next phase of your study yeah that, and that's what i did so i also don't understand why they they said it in the pilot first and then do the focus groups last because the focus groups would inform the pilot study so yeah, i just think that that's around the wrong that, way because that's all because they, they, we have already, like you can see, we have already created a model. So we have all the factors here. We are using Pombi model and uh, you can see, I'll just uh, make it a little bigger. Oh no. So, how do I do that? Yeah, so yeah. So can you see a little bit bigger now? Mm -hmm. 
so there 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 are like capability motivation and opportunity which influences behavior and they have these sub dimensions here so we have already uh, i have already uh, find the questions for my survey from previous studies so that's why they said your uh, your online survey is already so we can start with the pilot survey and online survey and then we can do focus groups but i talked with some of other lecturers here and they said there is no point of doing focus groups at the end because if they don't match with your results with the online survey then what will you do you will not show up in your thesis so better to do focus groups first and then do online surveys i agree and, and there and there is no point of doing a pilot study and then focus group as well because uh, they they give the same results so yeah so i'm 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 trying to collect facts to talk to my supervisors that okay we will not do doing pilot surveys maybe just we'll do with 10 10 15 people as we always do and then we will go with the focus group and then online surveys does it sounds good i think so i think that sounds what much more logical yeah does anyone else have anything that they'd like to contribute i know that gurmeet has got a great um a great uh, discussion board on the community section of and where she's asked about mixed methods and I know when I have a spare moment I'm going to jump back in there and have a chat about it because I find it a really fascinating subject um how you design your research to find out your answer I'll just anyone else want to pipe in I've got straight I've got a Yeah, I've got a comment. Um, yeah, really, really good work, Gamit. Uh, I the way the world is and the way the world is going, we definitely need to encourage people to eat more plant-based food, and any information that can contribute to encouraging that and um, championing people's um, people's diets to include more vegetables in every way is a really good idea and i'm very happy yeah. to be surveyed thank you me also <laughs> me too <laughs> yeah i might contact you all guys for focus group if i'm going to do focus groups because then i need more people to interact and do focus groups yeah yes and i can also help you find some other people as well oh yeah that's a great idea yeah thank you you're welcome Thank you so I'll, I'll put it out there again I'll give everyone another few seconds if you wanted to pipe up and and say something otherwise we'll move on to Megan and continue the mixed methods conversation over in the community board Yeah I'll stop sharing Does anyone else one last chance Well Megan has two posters to share about so I'm going to hand directly over to Megan to introduce her topic Can everyone see my screen? Yes, yeah. all good. Yeah. Great, great. So, I've got two posters to present today. Um I'm at uh 8 months out from finishing my PhD, so I have collected all my data and I am in the process of analyzing/writing up. Um The very first project that I did within my PhD right at the beginning was I did a systematic review of systematic reviews which is called an umbrella review. There was uh, about 17 systematic reviews um on my topic and my topic is diet and depression. And all the systematic reviews that I read had conflicting messages. Some said that diet did have play a role in depression, some said that diet didn't play a role in depression i was like well we use systematic reviews as the top level of hierarchy of evidence and if we're doing that and we've got 17 systematic reviews saying different things then something needs to be done about that so i decided to review them all and produced my umbrella review which is uh being reviewed for publication at the present moment what i found in my umbrella review was that Mediterranean dietary patterns are the best dietary pattern in the world for uh mental health including depression 
Um, Mediterranean dietary patterns mainly consist of fresh fruit, nuts, seeds, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, a little bit of meat, uh, so a very small portion of meat, uh, large amounts of oily fish, olive oil, and a small consumption of red wine and dark chocolate, which is great. Yay. Um, we also found that the Western diet, which is a bit sad because that's where we are. We're in, we're in a Western society. The Western diet is the worst diet for mental health. Um, Western diets are typically high in processed uh, processed foods, processed meats, uh, sugary beverages, sugary sweetened beverages, I mean, su sugary foods and sugar sweetened beverages, um, lots of vegetable oils, um, things like that, and lots of takeaway. And Uber Eats kind of lifestyle is taking over, whereas in the Mediterranean, people tend to eat all in this big social context. So um, that's what I found in my umbrella review. And the umbrella review informed the next stage of my research project, which was my focus group study, which is this one here. Has that changed, Katie? Can everyone see the focus group study? Yes. Great. Yes. Excellent. Yes, so my focus group study, the reason that we decided to do a mixed methods research project and have a look at a focus group study as the first arm of my project was because of all, when I did my umbrella review, there was like over 200 papers on dietary patterns and depression, but all of them were quantitative. 97% of them were observational, so surveys and longitudinal studies. And there were only three randomized controlled trials that have ever been done on diet and depression. Zero qualitative studies, zero mixed methods research in diet and depression. So we thought we would take the opportunity to do that for ourselves. So in July and August of last year, we conducted nine focus groups across SEU and Griffith Uni um, with 55 participants. So we had about 35 students, about 14 staff members and about six accredited practicing dietitians. So we've got a couple of different um, populations to talk to and we asked them about what their experiences were with food and mood and what we found was very interesting so we found that although there was a lot of this nutritional component to diet and mood there was also these other things that were really really important like the social context within which people ate and i think that was the main one but there was also this uh, theme that came through about growing and preparing your own food and cooking as part of um, mental health and relaxation when you're cooking your own food from scratch and putting love into it and and the time that you get with your family was also really good for mental health we also found that foods that were convenient or eaten really quickly or eaten in front of the television or as i said the uber eats lifestyle that we have where you're not paying attention to what you're eating and you do it in a very independent way or in front of your computer while you're working that led to lower mood in participants and intuitive eating which really goes down that track that Yagi was talking about with mindfulness earlier um, intuitive eating is all about mindful eating and eating what your body is telling you it wants and listening to your body's cues when it's hungry when it's not hungry and really listening to what your body is saying and we found that um eating intuitively and eating mindfully really um resonated with higher levels of mood uh the last uh all of the things that we found out in our focus group then informed the next stage of my project which was a longitudinal study um and we accessed pre-existing data from the Australian Longitudinal Study on Women's Health and we used what we found in the focus group to pull variables out to measure across the, la the last 25 years, every three years, women in Australia were um, asked about their diet and depression and other variables such as physical activity, um, mindfulness, social function, all those things and we are currently analysing that. So that is my three kind of armed mixed methods research. Does anyone have a question? I think there's some chat 
that I haven't been able to access. I have a. Hey, Megan, can, can can I talk? Yes. Um, can you say something about olive oil? How um, what what? How does olive oil work with um, with what you're talking about? Yes, absolutely. Well, I've got some feedback. I'm okay now. You might just ask um, everyone who's not talking to mute themselves. So olive oil is really um, interesting, Yagya. Um, way back when I started my PhD, I really looked at food components rather than dietary patterns as a whole. And one of the things that came up was um, this very this leaning to, away from vegetable oils and towards uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids. Now, um, olive oil is um, one of those, as is uh, oily fish also has polyunsaturated fatty acids in it. And they are very, very helpful for um, mood and mental health um, outcomes. So um, just the fact that people in the Mediterranean do tend to eat a lot of olive oil, um, is very interesting in the fact that they have those really great um, outcomes for mental health and dementia as well. I think Shay was trying to speak at the same time before. It's okay. Um, thank you, Megan. Wonderful work. Yes, uh, so incredibly, incredibly, incredibly important and so important for... Um, people doing a PhD to eat properly. <laughs> so, I find myself sometimes that I'm busy eating a piece of toast, so I'm feeling guilty listening to you. But um, I'm very fascinated by what you said about dark chocolate because that's um, a stable comfort food for me, really good quality organic dark chocolate. So I wondered if you could say something more about that. Yep. So... Um if you want to learn a little bit more about this, there is a, an amazing podcast on Spotify and Apple iPlay. I don't know what it's called, Apple Play, um, called Thinking Nutrition by Tim Crow. Um, he goes through, there's probably about 20 of them now, but one of them's on chocolate and the health benefits of eating chocolate. And he, he talks about dark chocolate in particular. So dark chocolate is, out of all the chocolates, it's the lowest in sugar content. Um, it also is massively high in antioxidants and antioxidants you also find in fruit and veg, tea, red wine <laughs> and yeah, I think that's it. But antioxidants are one of the major players in um, physical and mental health. And that's one of the things that I'm finding in my research is that all the things that you're told about improving and optimal men, uh, physical health are the same things that are important for mental health. So it's not different. You don't have to go and say, oh, what are the good foods for mental health? Because they're one and the same. It's really, really simple. It's basically eat things fresh, natural and raw as close to their, post, their, their original state as possible and stay away from things that have been processed or I mean ultra processed because everything's processed. Once you pick it, that's a process. But these ultra processed foods that have like high amounts of ingredients that you don't understand. If it comes in a box, a jar or a packet, it's probably not great for you. Shop on the exterior of the shopping center. Stay out of the middle aisles. That's it. And eat lots of dark chocolate and drink lots of wine. No, Thank you. Don't, that's don't great that. advice, um, <laughs> Megan. We've got one question in the chat here from Madison, she's asked, do you think weight loss slash gain is important, sorry, is as important as overall dietary pattern? Okay, Madison, you way. have hit a very interesting point for me because my honours year project, which was four years ago now, was on the um, intuitive eating, which is what I was talking about before, and dieting and weight-focused thinking in women and i was looking particularly at population of postpartum women so women who had children between zero and four years and what we found in that study was that body image satisfaction self-esteem psychological um, wellness and self-efficacy were all highly linked to eating intuitively and getting rid of weight focused thinking 
So I'm a big non-diet um, advocate. I don't believe in diets. I hate the word diet. So diet and dietary patterns are completely different. I'm all about not depriving yourself of the foods that you love. I'm all about making healthy swaps into foods that you that you love, your comfort foods that you that you love, just putting the healthier ingredients in and having an education on what th those things are. And I'm definitely all about um, healthy at every size. So no matter what you weigh, you can be healthy. There are skinny people out there who are unhealthy. There are people who are in plus size bodies who are healthy. Do you know what I mean? So that whole weight focus thinking is a real big thing for me. Can I ask a question, Megan? Yep. So um, I really like what you were saying about, I think we often focus on the food products themselves and the components of food and stuff. But you also said that the social component of eating is really important. And you said taking the time to cook for oneself, for instance, with fresh ingredients and, and feeling that as a meditative space. And I think it's not just the preparing of food, but I know entire families who have never sat down together in their entire family life to share a meal. Yep. So what are your thoughts about the importance of um, um, sharing a meal together as a way of, you know, checking in with each other, yep. um, sharing ideas, creating a family identity, a group identity and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, absolutely. And that was the main theme that came out of that focus group study was people really attached mental wellness with that sitting down with people and eating well and eating together and cooking together and the laughing and the reaching over each other and talking and rather than like in western society we kind of eat on one plate in our space in the mediterranean they're like put out big platters of food and people are like reaching over and talking and laughing and music and all that sort of stuff and that doesn't quite happen as much in our western society it was really interesting one of the girls in the focus group said to me you know i can take i can pack up my lunch with tomatoes and salad and kale and whole grains and legumes and bring it to work and i can sit in my cubicle at work and eat it by myself and not even think about the food that's going into my body. And I don't think I'm going to be as healthy as if I go down the street with my friends and eat something that's a little bit more um, unhealthy. And she thinks I, she said, I think I'm going to get more nutrition from that food um, while I'm eating in a social context and sitting by myself. And there's actual research out there now that shows that when a human body is in a relaxed state or in a state of, um, happiness that you actually do absorb the nutrition from your food better gosh that's fascinating megan <laughs> um in the chat i've got a request to ask another question we are over time so okay. what i'm going to request is i'm just going to really briefly give instructions about where we're about to go in the conference and then if you are amenable yep. I'll, uh, yep. We'll ask the other question yep, no problem. straight after that. So um, thank you to all of the uh, presenters in this session. It was really fun to talk to each other. It's, it's really lovely seeing everyone's faces and a big congratulations to everyone. These conversations can be continued in their appropriate um, spaces. It'll be easiest for the speakers to find your questions if you put them underneath their sections. This afternoon, we are breaking into three streams. Um, same as this morning, I really encourage you to stick around and, and support everyone. I'm hoping to, by early evening, have all of the recordings up for you to watch any of the ones that you've missed. So um, a great big thank you for everyone turning up and we hope to see you in the next session, which will be starting at 2.30 Queensland time and 3.30 New South Wales times. Um, so um, I am going to skip back to that quiz question. It's from Just quickly, sorry, Katie, just quickly before you do that, 
I just wanted to put a shout out to everyone. I'm just putting in the chat box right now a link to a survey. It only takes 10 minutes. It's for my honours student who's doing his project on diet and depression and he's finding it because of COVID. He's finding really, really hard to get participants. So it's meat eaters, vegetarians and vegans. It takes 10 minutes. Please do the survey and share it on your socials if you can to get other people because we really want him to be able to um, submit his honest thesis, the poor little thing. So yeah, if you can help us out, that would be amazing. And I'll, I'll put it in the chat in, um, in the actual um, Hoover platform as well, because I think yeah. that went into the Zoom chat. So um, okay. we will meet everyone at 2.30, uh, which gives us a bit of time to um, move around and have something um, nutritious to eat. But I'm just gonna okay. zip back up to this question. From Richard, um, I'd be interested to hear Megan's thoughts on how we engage with food, perhaps as distinct from the types of food we consume, specifically food in box services and mental health. So you were already touching on that, how we engage in food, but food in box services. And Richard, feel free to pipe up as well if you... Food in box services are really interesting. I'm assuming that you were talking about things like HelloFresh. Where you get. Yeah, hi. 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 Yeah, exactly. That's right. So, and I guess the specific, um, and you have touched upon this in your previous answer, but the particular context in which I tend to consider these food inbox services, which I'm very against at a personal level, is people who tend to live in very, uh, so I'm in inner Melbourne, uh, mm -hmm. there's a lot of high rise apartments around me. So, actually, you can have these situations emerging whereby people are waking up in the morning, pre-COVID, they would get on a tram and go to an office block, they would come home and waiting at their door would be a box a box of food, literally with instructions telling them, this is what you unwrap first, this yep. is what you can do with this piece of food. And you don't actually have to have any engagement at all with the process of actually acquiring your food. And, and I just, it, it seems to be a separate step of disengagement from your environment. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I hear you completely. And there are two sides of the story. I'm really passionate about our disconnection from our food source. Um, so much so that one of the things that really bugs me is that we can go to the supermarket and buy these trays of meat with the pl wrap, plastic wrap on it and bring it home and cook the steak and eat it. But we're so disconnected from the process of how that steak got into that plastic wrap. I don't know how many of us would still be meat eaters if we were forced to slaughter our own animals and, and re well, re rear them first, raise them, slaughter them and eat them. I don't know how many of us would still remain meat eaters if that was the case. Um, there's also this argument about why is it okay to eat cows, but it's not okay to eat horses and dogs. They're, they're still animals. This, and it's this weird, um, thing about meat that and and i i do still eat meat i tried a plant-based diet and my ferritin levels um decreased so dramatically that i was forced to go back to eating meat so i am a meat eater um i do promote plant-based diets though they are the best for mental health um the other thing so the thing with the boxed meals is that there's two sides to it so box meals are really good for people who would normally eat a western dietary pattern and we know that the Western dietary pattern is high in those processed foods, takeaway foods, convenience foods, because people don't know how to cook or people haven't been raised to know how to cook from scratch. Um, and that is something that's just predominant in our culture. In the Mediterranean, children are reared to learn how to cook. Um, so these boxes actually can be quite good for people because they are full of fresh ingredients from the natural source. However, they're not so great for understanding about where food comes from, exactly what you were saying. <laughs> great, thank you. Um, while you're waiting there, and if nobody else has a question, I should just, by way of you know, digressing, I, I have set for myself that very task of raising my own meat. Um, so. <gasps> Stay tuned. I, I have raised some lambs and it's about the time um, when, you know, D-Day is sort of on the line and I'm a meat eater and I think it's, it's um, 
really um, yeah. full of hypocrisy for me to say I won't eat my own lamb, but I'm happy to walk to the supermarket and buy something off the shelf. I so, know, I know, and, and it's it's kind of this cognitive dissonance that we have in this society that we don't even think about. It's amazing. Yeah. I'd like to make a, a comment on that thread there. I fully agree with you, Megan, and quite a while ago decided that I was only going to eat the meat that I was prepared to um, slaughter myself. And so I was eating chicken and goat, which I had both of those, but I, I completely stopped eating beef, which I didn't eat much of because I was also working with cows and they're in, I just could they're too sentient. There was no way that I could ever have slaughtered a cow. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, I was actually raising my own fish as well in the dam and actually found it harder to kill a fish. Yeah. Birds was really easy, but the, the fish were so innocent. It was really fascinating. Anyway, yeah. it's just a We go fishing in, in our family and I'm not a really good fisherman which is probably a good thing, but I did catch a fish two weeks ago when we were camping and he came out of the water on the hook and then normally you can get the hook out, but it was stuck right down his throat and I was like panicking and I like felt so bad for him and I was trying really hard to get the, the hook out without injuring him and when it finally came out, I put him back in the water and I just, I, I said, that's it. My fishing days are over. I can't handle it. I can't do that. To yeah. Do you know fish? Fish took like four hours to die after water. After you took it out of the water, so it, it's it's really painful for her. Like four hours of not being and, able to breathe. Yeah. 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 It's hard. Wow. <laughs> Well, that's a sad note to end on there, but what a fantastic discussion. Thank you so much um, for engaging with us. We've got 30 minutes um, before our next session. I'm happy to stay on and have a chat, but if everyone needs to go um, and have a move around, um, we can end this now and um, see everyone back in the sessions at 2.30 slash 3.30. Happy to, all right. Well, I'm gonna head on. We'll see you soon. See ya.